So who, uh, who was this their first Palm Sunday service? Anyone? Anyone do this for the first time? Are you a little, do you feel bamboozled? <laughs> a little bit uh, surprised like a Trojan horse. We come in with a party and we end with a crucifixion. Um, but that's the thing about God. God is wild. Um, when Job cried out to God, God met him in a whirlwind. Spoke to him out of winds that could destroy but did not. When Moses was in the wilderness, God met him in a burning bush. Fire that was on the bush but did not consume it. God is wild and we cannot tame him. He will do what we do not expect him to do. He will act in ways we do not expect him to act. And he will enter the story in moments we did not expect him to enter the story. And this is one of them. See, we who have done Palm Sunday service before knew that we were going to start with palms and end with yelling crucify him. But the disciples, the followers of Jesus, had no clue. See, the triumphal entry was, for them, their moment of triumph. Jesus was entering as king. This is the moment. The excitement they must have felt. Three years of following him, and now we are here. We know what he is about to do. He is going to overthrow Rome. He is going to reestablish Jerusalem. He is going to be the king, the son of David. And the reason they believe this is not just the triumphal entry. We have to go back before the event of the triumphal entry to understand that Jesus is orchestrating something here. He has made this happen. It's not like he got caught by surprise, right? It wasn't like, oh, look at all these people. They even think, you know, they're excited. Where did they come from? I had no hand in this. He was not caught by surprise. He knew because he had orchestrated it. In John chapter 11, right, Jesus brings Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, right? That's where they are when the triumphal entry starts. They're right there by Bethany, two miles outside of Jerusalem. I have walked that path. I have unfortunately fallen down that path <laughs> um, trying to navigate the rain. And it says, after the resurrection, it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found Jesus and there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, so in response to raising Lazarus from the dead two miles from Jerusalem, the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. As well as who? As well as Jesus. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. He created a crowd, a crowd of believers, right there, two miles from Jerusalem. And then we get into the Gospel of Mark, and in Mark chapter 10, on the way, where chapter 11 is a triumphal entry, in Mark chapter 10, we encounter this. Jesus is stopped, or it says, um, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man. Cheer up on your feet, he is calling you. Throwing the cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want, from, what do you want me to do for you? 
Jesus asked him, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The road to Jerusalem. But there's more than meets the eye in that event. Because this is the one moment when Jesus is called Son of David, that is, King of Kings, that he does not deny it. He does not avoid it. Typically, if someone says it, he's like, be quiet, or just kind of disappears. But this time he said, what do you want from the son of David? They all heard. He claimed the title of king. So he has risen, he's brought a person from the dead. He has gathered a crowd. He is in that crowd that is going down this road. Claim the title of king. And then he sends disciples back to Bethany where he, he says over there, Bethany is over there. That's where he's pointing. Back to Bethany, the place where he brought Lazarus back from the dead. And he says, get me a colt that has never been ridden. That is, get me the horse of a king. The, the animal that David rode into Jerusalem. Get me that. And if they ask you, or they try to stop you, which he assumes they won't because it's him, and he just brought Lazarus from the dead. If they stop you, tell them it's for me. Well, that's going to spread fast. He's created the crowd. He's created the excitement. He has created all of this. And he's riding in as king. As king and more than king. What I mean by that is when the second temple was built, unlike the first temple, you can find no point in the scriptures where the Shekinah, where the glory of God enters the temple. You can find no part where God makes his home in the temple. That means the exile has not ended. And why can it not end? Because they are under the rule of another country. If you read Genesis 9, 11, you'll un- 9 or 10 and 11, you'll understand that his glory cannot come down there because it's under a false king, a king that is not the proper king. But see, Jesus is, as he said over and over again, the I am. That is, Yahweh. The presence of God is coming to his temple. All is good. All is exciting. What a wonderful thing. But there's just one thing. In Luke 19, in the narrative of Jesus coming to the temple... He is not smiling and laughing. He is weeping. So they're yelling Hosanna, which means God save us. Son of David, save us. Hosanna means save us. They're saying save us. And they think, okay, we're going to overthrow Rome. We're going to become the rulers of the world. It is time. And this is what's happening with Jesus. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that, you even, would that you, even you, had known on this day that the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set a, a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. He is coming as judge. He is coming as king, but he is coming as judge. In the Mark passage, it ends with him entering the temple. He looks around, and in the part passage we don't have, he says, And then he leaves because the hour is late. Because the hour is late. He is coming. He is weeping. See, we think, they think 
that he is going to do what they want him to do. But he is coming to do it very differently. God does not act in the ways that we expect or demand him to act. But also, he forces the question. Once he has brought Lazarus from the dead, once he has claimed his name, once he has gotten on that horse and rode into Jerusalem, he is forcing this key question, which I love the way Tim Keller words it. Crown me or kill me. There's no lukewarm. There's no half ways or half measures here. He is forcing the question. Jerusalem, you will either crown me as your king or you will kill me. Uh, Leslie Newbegin says the gospel is a sword. And when its truth is spoken to you, it cuts your heart in two. And you have to choose the part of your heart that desires God and the part that desires the things of this world. You have to choose. That's the way God works. Crown me as your king or kill me. And he's weeping because he knows the choice. And not only because the religious leaders kill him, but because the Romans kill him, because Pilate kills him, because we all kill him. And he weeps for the condition of humanity. You see, the cross and the judgment that is to come is a judgment upon us because of the way we receive God when he comes. He is not controllable. He can't hand him in and put him in a box. We can't, and we are unwilling to crown him king. So we must kill him. And he weeps for us. And then he brings the judgment down upon his own head. See, God becomes at the end, in this very unexpected, uncontrollable way, both the judge and the judged. He becomes God who judges. God is in his house. And the person judged us. For what we do to him, he receives the penalty. He receives the weight of it all. God does not work how we want him to. He works for what is good. The question that comes to us in this, how many of you when you have to yell, crucify him, get a little shaky in your stomachs. Maybe you mumble it. Maybe you don't do it. You should yell it. You should yell it. Because the question that comes in this whole action to you is crown me or kill me. And we crown him by saying, I got nothing. I have nothing to offer you. I can't sit back and look around and say, oh, well, you know, those, it's too bad those people acted that way. I wouldn't have. I would have gotten it. The point was, no one got it. Even his disciples were gone, right? They abandoned him. The question you are asked, and you don't get to be lukewarm about it, is are you in total need of God and is he your king? Do you give all you have to him? Do you crown him? Or do you turn away from it all? There's only two brave choices. Crown him or kill him. And that is what God asks every time the gospel comes. Will you follow God? Will you give yourself to him? Will you say, I need you? There is no other way. You have 100% of me. You have 100% of my life. Or turn away and say this was a fool. 
one more false messiah riding in to be crucified. He's one of many. And so I want to leave you with that for this Holy Week as we enter into Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then with the hope and the answer to all this in Easter. God comes to your heart and says, Am I king? Crown me. And give all that is of this world away. And follow me. And now we'll turn to this table where we participate in and remember what he has done. This is a participation in his flesh and his blood that was rend on the cross and shed for us. Come here and bow your knee and crown him. King. Amen.